So, hi guys, uh, my name is Sasha. I am a computer programmer, and programmer in, at Subsurf. Uh, I do computer programming for eight years straight. <laughs> and uh, so it's my first time when I'm trying to participate in C++ community. So don't judge me hard. I, I'm not really sure what you're expecting from me. Uh, so let's try to do it and I'll be ready for any like complaints and suggestions <laughs> after it. So uh, my topic is C++ uh, 11, and actually this part is multi-threading in C++ 11. So currently we are meeting uh, multi-threading, which actually uh, possible in C++ 14 and C++ 17, but I still uh, will make few remarks to C++ 17 if it, if it better or if it has some additional functionality. Uh, but we skip it now. So the topic itself is huge, actually. So um, my idea is to divide this topic on few parts. Like first part, what I'll introduce you today, it will be about uh, how to implement uh, some basic application using multi-threading in C++11. You'll see that it's very easy with a uh, new framework from C++11. And uh, maybe we will go, if, if you like it, maybe we will go with part two when I'll show you uh, some uh, real world example and we will uh, bit, uh, extend the seam to architectural approaches what you can have with uh, multi-threading and which approach is better and why it's better so yeah let's start so uh, science C++ 11 we got a multi-threading library which calls uh, Threads Ash. So see, uh, you can see I have a bunch of examples, a bunch of exercises, and we start with exercise one. And you see this library is called Thread Library. Uh, it contains multi-threading functionality, uh, which gives you possibility to create new threads. Uh, so what Thread is actually? Uh, thread actually is uh, uh, this thing. So Thread actually is a uh, separated call stack so it's like it's almost like separated application it has its own uh, call stack but it still uses shared memory which actually uh, dedicated to your application so if you have some heap allocated memory a uh, thread has like complete access to this memory and it's the main difference uh, between thread and processes because process don't have access to memory from separated process like if two processes run application, like here you see, uh, they need to use this inter-process communication and they don't have access to any shared memory. They all, uh, all the memory is isolated. It was made for a specific purpose because uh, sometimes uh, programmers make mistakes and uh, your pointer can start looking in some different location to some different application actually. And in this case, uh, operation system actually operating system doing a uh, memory violation exception to you uh, to show you that you're doing something wrong. You're looking in different memory, and you no need to lose that. Uh, but thread actually <laughs> give you possibility to have some shared memory uh, between two different uh, almost applications, which which has their own call stacks. And it makes actually things much faster because this interprocess communication took a lot of time, uh, but it also gives you a much more safer way to uh, run a few different tasks. So uh, to you, uh, if you start to doing something like this, you may think first, what better to you? It's using multi-threading or actually multi-process uh, run. Like for example, browsers, uh, they are multi-processes, they're not multi-threaded, like all top browser actually run in separated process. It's actually a separated process, not separated thread. Uh, but for our topic, we're looking for threads. So, uh, and how it looks actually on dual core CPU, for example, if you run like uh, some application which do some task like uh, red, green, red, green. We actually can separate this uh, task on two, two cores and runs like two times faster. So uh, let's shortly speak about why we need to use multi threading and let's go to real examples. So uh, there are two things why you need to use multi threading. Like, first thing is actually uh, to divide actually tasks on your application. 
uh, to divide responsibility in your application. For example, if your application has some UI user interface and it has some main logic, and for example, you want to load some file and you want to show a progress bar uh, during loading your file, it actually makes sense to divide your application into different threads because uh, uh, it will be much better from architectural standpoint because when you loading some item you know need to go into rendering and call like redraw frame every time when you're loading some chunk of data it because if you do this it's also possible but your code will look like very bad in this case because you like interrupt loading going to redraw frame and getting back and loading some chunk again and interrupt again and if you have two threads in this way and like first thread drawing ui for you it's actually call a redrawing instantly like every time and also another thread is loading some file instantly every time and you don't have uh, collisions in your code like you have like two separated bunch of codes which looks looks very clear which doing its own job and which runs in separate threads and second thing why you, why you need actually multi-threading it's for of course it's for, for optimization to make up your application runs faster like if you have more cores, you can run application faster. So let's start with a simple example here. Uh, so it show you how you can use uh, this thread library. So every multi-threaded application, C++ 11 started with this include thread stuff. And uh, see you have like some simple function job, which just do pretty much nothing and just Uh, call C out a few times and show actually thread ID every time when, when it's like running this loop. So uh, let's run this application. And you see how it runs. Like uh, you see that's first actually run, it's uh, going in one line straightforward because it's this job function which actually runs uh, step by step. It's not run separately. But when you're going here, when this function actually done, when this job function done, you see mass actually started. Why is this mass started? Because uh, so how thread works. Uh, when you create this thread, this job function will run immediately in separate thread. So when thread creates, it also automatically calls invoke function. And uh, it runs this job function in separate thread immediately. So it's not just uh, creation of the thread. It's not just initialization of the thread. It's actually uh, execution of the thread. So, uh, and you see like I created four different threads. I, uh, for every thread I used uh, some specific way how you can create the thread. So you have actually four different ways to create the thread, it's really cool in C++11 and all this like uh, four threads was executed in parallel and you see what mass actually is going on it's job is simple function just typing c out thread id and if it runs consistently like previously it runs step by step it looks good but when it's run in multi-threading it looks like complete mess because threads interrupt itself it's not synchronized but it still works and it still works in multiple threads, which which goes cool, so. up. Uh, so let's look on this uh, four ways what you have to run uh, threads. So first you can pass a uh, different thread by pointer to a function. Uh, it's actually a classic way if you used WinAPI uh, or POSIX multi-threading, uh, you'll see like pretty much same approach. You can pass pointer by function and, and run it. But C++11 has much more. Uh, C++11 has uh, also job uh, also ability to pass by uh, class, not just by, by function. And if you pass like this by class, it actually will use overrided operator, uh, over this operator. Uh, and this actually operator will run in separate thread if you pass a uh, thread like class, you see this. Also you can pass a uh, thread like lambda function. Uh, I think everybody knows what is lambda function in C++11. It's actually a function which you can uh, write inside 
uh, another function. So uh, I don't think it's a great idea. I use it quite often, but sometimes it's very useful. So uh, you see, I create a lambda function and uh, inside the thread, and it also runs immediately when I created this thread. And at last but not least, it actually great sync. You can pass uh, uh, another thread, go to another thread like method. Uh, for those who actually work with C++ for a long time, you know that previously you 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 couldn't pass a method like a pointer to function. It was a really problem. Actually, you you could if you write some proper to this. Uh, you can actually pass some pointer to the function, which itself actually called pointer to the method. It was possible, yeah. But you can't, uh, you couldn't directly pass a uh, pointer to the method previously. But with C++11, now it's possible. You can pass pointer to the method. So what I have here, I have class job provider, and actually I have method job for this class, and I just passed this method into thread, and I pass actually pointer to, uh, object of this class. So, and it also runs in separate thread. So it's very cool, like, uh, technically to write a multi-threaded application, what you need to do, like, for example, if you want to have two threads, what you need to do is to just create a std thread, and uh, like, let's say thread one, and pass some function, like, let's say, handler one. And that's pretty much it, like, you can describe this handler one, how it works, and that's your first thread. And if you want to pass like second thread, you just type like thread two, handler two. It's, it's tremendously simple, it's very useful, and, but it also has a lot of k words. And if it was like so simple, uh, we will not have like 10 exercises here. <laughs> but, uh, it's very, it's very simple to start with multi-threading in C++11. Oh, it's Thunder started here in Kiev, so yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's very simple. You can use it very easily, but uh, let's go to those keywords what we have. So how actually main thread, no, like this exercise one is run in main thread, you see this main, and it's called exercise one. So how, how actually, I'm sorry guys, probably because of the ton of some problems with internet connection. Yeah, uh, so how actually main thread know about uh, those created threads and what if actually this new created threads actually finished uh, after main thread? What if main thread already finished its execution? and uh, this new created thread still runs, still calculated something. So for this, we have this join function in C++11. Uh, actually, there are two functions, there are join and there are also detach function here. Yeah, uh, so join a function, it actually joins new created thread to current thread, uh, to actually main thread or to those thread where a uh, new thread was created. So it actually joins this child to its parent. So parent thread, it actually thread where this thread was created and this is its child. So uh, what I'm doing here technically, I'm just saying to uh, my child thread to join to the main thread and it joins. And what does it mean I join to the main thread? It means the main thread will wait until its child is finished their job. So. If we go in here, like, and I call join, that's actually the block execution. So, for example, I created this uh, new thread here, and it starts to run, it doesn't wait. It just starts to run, it keeps going to calculate something. So you see this mess actually happened here. Like, it started to cal calculate something like thread uh, 41784 actually running, and next thread actually started to write right between actually execution of the first thread. So it's, it doesn't block execution of main thread. It just created and runs separately. And next thread actually created, it also trying to run separately. And now two threads running separately. 
and now three threads, four threads running separately. But when I call in this join, that means stop. That means wait for this guy. So do not execute farther until this guy will finish his job. So, and main threads started actually waiting here. It doesn't mean that other three threads will stop. No, they, they just continue executions. They just continue the mass here. But main thread actually will stop here and be waiting until this guy actually finishes its job. And uh, after this, it goes to check this guy, this guy, and this guy. So uh, you can see that STT thread must always call join or detach before flow execution reaches the destructor. What does it mean? It means if this exercise one actually will reach the destructor, like if it's finished, so all these created threads will go out of scope. Yeah, they also have a scope like in C++ and the structure for these threads will be called. And if not join or detach will call be before actually these threads reach out of scope of this function, it will call terminate. It will be uh, error, it will be pro pro programmatical error. So, as to that thread must always call join or detach before flow of execution, like before reach this point. <laughs> yeah, so uh, usually you need to join. Detach is very advanced thing. And uh, uh, what doing detach? Detach doing actually pretty much opposite to join. It actually say do not wait this thread, like uh, leave it. So if we're going here, uh, if we're going out of scope, this thread will not be destroyed if the touch was called. Like uh, this thread will continue to live even if actually scope for this function was loose. That's mean the touch. But it's obvious way to run into memory leak if you're doing this incorrectly because thread continue to exist and scope for this is already uh, lost. So the touch is quite advanced thing, and uh, usually it's not recommended to use, but it's still here, it's still up to you. So what you, want, need, what you need to use is actually join uh, to synchronize a thread, your child threads with your parent threads. So uh, that's the simplest example what you can get. Uh, I'll show what, how, how it works. It runs like separately. Uh, on four threads, and actually I have four core CPU here. It's my office machine, very remote desktop, and I have these four cores, so that's how it works. So uh, I know the question must be at the end, but let's do it iteratively, guys, because there will be more information later, and if you don't get something on the beginning, it's better to ask now. So any questions? I think we can go to exercise two. Uh, so, <laughs> this exercise two is completely committed. Uh, why? Because it's actually show you pitfalls. Uh, so we can close this guy. It show you pitfalls of multi-threading. It show you how you can easily crash your application. So the first way to crash your application is to run join two times in a row. It will automatically crash your application. I can show you. Let's go to exercise two. And uh, let's go two times in a row. You see, I also run uh, application release mode to show you like all so, uh, tips and tricks and all how it works. Uh, so, give me a second. I'll probably need to debug mode to see. Uh, yep, so you see application actually crashed. It also crashed before on previous and release run, but uh, you can see any message because debugger was detached. I run it without debugger using control F5. So now the de debugger is attached, so you can see that it's called crash to you. If you run it two times, you know, same with detach. If you run detach two times in a row, it also will crash application. And pretty much same. Uh, 
uh, like this to crush your application too. That's what I uh, spoke about in previous example. Uh, like when you're going out of scope and do not calling join or detach, it will also crash your application. Uh, so uh, join or detach must be called and it must be called just one time not two times, not three times, just one time after execution. Uh, okay, so it was simple. Let's go to exercise three. And exercise three, uh, I'll show you how to pass arguments into function because firstly you can see I call this job function, but it's, it doesn't take any, uh, any attributes, it just all of this actually is quite and two functions, and it just uses global variable. And let's put you my sheet. Uh, it's also actually that thing what we uh, spoke in the previous example, the shared memory, like you see, thread one and thread two actually shared memory. And you can see in exercise one, it uses actually global variable, and this global variable actually uses in different threads. Like all these four threads, they actually uses this global variable, and it actually, that's what we're talking here. It's shared memory for all threads, and it gives us like some benefits, but we need to be careful because uh, no uh, inter-process communication protection. Uh, okay, let's go to exercise three. Uh, how to pass attributes inside the function? It's very trivial, it's very simple. It's almost as simple like create uh, as a new thread, like you saw before, just type as to do thread, pass function in, and keep going. Same with attribute, but just you need to additionally pass some attribute to function. So this is just job attribute function. It's pretty much the same function, but it's not based on global variable. It just use pass it function. Pass it actually variable. And uh, you see, it's, it's tremendously simple. It's almost in the same way, but you just pass the additional attribute here. Like, uh, Plain and simple, just like previous example was like this. And if you want to pass some attribute into your function, you just pass some attribute into your function, like into thread constructor. So it's very easy, it works in the same way, it's very cool. Uh, so another thing actually what you see here, it's a, a pass attribute by pointer. It works absolutely in the same way, like in classic C++, just use a, a reference symbol and get the uh, address of your variable and you can pass the pointer. Uh, this is this function which job attribute pointer is actually take a pointer. Uh, so it's very simple, but uh, you need to be careful with pointers because uh, you can actually go out of scope. Like for example, if you pass some pointers into a function and call detach, like it's absolutely valid, like let's say, close this join. It's absolutely valid. valid. Uh, you're doing great. You, you're saying to your applications that I want that this thread actually live uh, after we going out from exercise three. I want that this thread will still live. But you actually will crash your application because you passed actually pointer to variable which in scope of exercise three. And after thread actually going out from scope, thread will be alive, but value will be, what attribute will be validated, it will be dead. So, and pointer to attribute will be invalid. So be careful when you're passing value by pointers or reference into your thread, because your thread can live longer than your pointer or your reference. So be careful here. Uh, so let's go to some tricky stuff. Uh, so the trick is tough here, how to pass value by reference. You see this uh, 3D function by reference. And uh, the naive way actually to pass value by reference is like this. So we have, you think it works like in the same way like attributes, like classic attributes because uh, uh, passing by value and by pointer actually has same syntaxes like in original C++. But, and you actually may think that passing by reference will be the same. No. In this way, actually, a thread will create a copy of this value. So it's dangerous. 
uh, be careful here. And uh, to pass value Boolean reference, you need to use stdref to create the actual reference for this std thread. So passing value by, by reference is not straightforward. You can't use just classic notation. You need to use a standard reference for for std thread. So you need to remember this. Uh, and same thing like this pointer. Be careful that your thread do not outlive your actual reference or your pointer. Ah. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, the same thing I also show you how to pass value by method. It's the same like by function. I uh, just, like previous example, you can see you pass value by method but without attribute. Uh, so you pass actually method to run a separate thread by but without attributes. And if you want to add some attributes in, you just, just add some attributes in. It's, it's very simple, very, yeah. So any questions? All this code actually runs, uh, but I'm trying to save us time. So I skip some runs, uh, but uh, I'll share this code later with you and you'll see like all this exercise is actually runnable. Uh, okay, let's go to exercise four. So exercise four, it's race conditions. So uh, in previous example, when you run exercise one, uh, you can see that you have a lot of race conditions. You see that your application can be a mess with multi-threading because uh, race do not synchronize, uh, threads do not synchronize with each other and actually run like this in uh, out of order execution. So let's say I want to um, synchronize thread to fight somehow with race conditions. So uh, this example actually show you more tricky version of race condition and because this exercise one is quite obvious that you have race condition. But in this way, you have very, very tricky uh, way. You need to know how CPU works. You need to know how to memory works to understand this race condition. And I'll try to explain you. So what are we doing here? We create a class wallet, actually. Uh, a simple class, which uh, you can add money in. Uh, so you can run adding money in separate threads. You created five threads to run money into your wallet. And uh, what doing actually add money just iteratively uh, adding this money uh, step by step. I know it's very inefficient. It's uh, you probably want to have some money plus money, but let's say you run it like this uh, in, in inside the loop, and every time you're running this, uh, uh, running it ten times to show you like the difference between every run, uh, but like every time you have five threads and every thread added one million to this uh, wallet. That's not bad money. <laughs> so uh, how do you think, how much money will be inside this wallet if five threads actually trying to add by one million? Uh, you may say like five million, but no, it's incorrect because uh, we will have race conditions here and we probably will have much lesser values. I can show you. Exercise form. Uh, things started to get interesting. It will be much more interesting later, guys. So can't I show you some plain examples? But later I'll show you some real application which runs in multi threading. And be patient. Uh, so you see how much money we weigh, we have from any run. It's every time it's different number. Despite uh, code is same. Like, it's same code executes like ten times. And every time it's, it's doing absolutely the same job, but every time you have absolutely different values. And that's why multi-threading is tremendously difficult to debug. If you make some mistake with multi-threading, you're going crazy. You don't know what is going on. Every year on is absolutely going with absolutely different results because of race conditions. So what race conditions happens here? Like this dress is not synchronized. And all the Five threads try to uh, increment this one value, this one integer value, and how it value. And actually, CPU keeping the guys. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, I hear you. Cool, because I I, I got the message that my internet is not so good. Uh, so uh, every time, actually, CPU. 
you uh, working with some value, it actually loads its in registry. It uses its registry memory to do some arithmetical operation on values. So what doing CPU, it actually runs five threads simultaneously and it actually runs five different registry. It loads this value in five different registry and doing this arithmetical operation on this value. And uh, after this, it's trying to write it back to the memory. But when it's writing this back to the memory, the another thread can override this value. And for example, both thread took this and both thread actually has zero. And one thread actually incremented it on one and another thread incremented it on one. And both actually write it into the memory. And uh, the result, the final result of this operation will be one, despite the two threads actually doing this uh, incrementing. And you probably expect that value will be two because like two threads get this value and do incrementation like two times, but no, you'll have this one incrementation. Even the two threads work simultaneously. And things get worse, worse when you have like, like five threads because some of them actually can write old values. Some thread actually started this operation uh, a bit later than other threads and finish it later and actually overrides all previous results from previous threads. So, and it's very random thing. And uh, it depends from a ton of things which not possible. It's, it's really undefined behavior here. So what do you need to do here to fix this issue? You need to uh, lock this value somehow. You need to, uh, you need to achieve uh, such behavior that only one thread can actually change this value by by the time like and another four threads will be waiting for it so let's go to exercise five uh, so exercise five how uh, like show you how to achieve it it runs absolutely the same code like you see but it runs it actually two time it have safer wallet and it have safe wallet so it doing the same thing, it runs like this thread five times, and uh, every thread actually added one million into this wallet. Uh, so what actually safer thread, a uh, safer wallet do? It actually using mutex. If you want to protect your data, you actually can use mutexes. Uh, what actually mutex do? Uh, this if uh, so this mutex has actually two states, lock and unlocked state. If a mutex state is unlocked, the thread actually can get this, can acquire this mutex and lock it. So like thread coming here, looking to state of this mutex, it unlocked. So thread acquires this mutex and go to running this code. Thread runs this code, going out and unlocking this mutex and keep forwarding. And all other threads which came here after like first thread, and see that this mutex already acquired and already locked, they will wait here. Like all other four threads, they will wait here until this mutex will be unlocked. Once this mutex is actually going to be unlocked, another thread actually acquires this mutex and runs this code and like locks this mutex, runs this code and unlock it back. So looks simple, uh, still very inefficient because despite we running this code in five threads, uh, like for us, the threads just waiting. <laughs> like uh, it executes code just one time uh, per thread, and other five threads just staying and waiting. So, same for another example. It's safe wallet. Uh, why is this wallet actually safer and this actually safe? Uh, because uh, when we're running this mutex, uh, when we're acquiring this mutex, and we keep it locked. And we're running this code, but if something happened during running this code, I know this example is quite simple and not much what can happen here. But let's say some exception happened here, or mm, like for some reason, or some actually uh, programmer uh, programming uh, error will be here, programmer mistake will be here, and programmer decided to return like, from this code. Like he said, okay getting back like I, I finished like if if I have enough money like uh, enough I just going back yeah so what does it mean that means mutex will still be locked and this thread will not call unlocked and all other thread will be waiting 
for for this mutex forever. Yeah, it can happen, and your application will stuck. And programmer mistake is actually easy to fix or possible to fix, but you also can have some exceptions here. You also can have like if you have some function here, for example, and this function draw exception to you, and your this function will be finished here because exception actually was called and we need to uh, return from this function. So this and it will be get same result. So if, if you're using some function which have exception here, it's always possible that your that this method actually will finish here. And this matrix will still be locked forever. So C11 give you possibility to not worry about it. And this possibility actually calls locks. So you have lock guard, uh, which actually can take mutex. Uh, it's using RAI principles. Uh, RAI -E -E principle. RAI principles mean uh, resource acquisition is initialization. It's quite famous programming stuff. Uh, so, you can read here if you, if you want to know more about this principle. It's just simple wrapper, which actually uh, give you ability to uh, run some code when you actually pass it this object. So it's it's actually in, initialized mutex when you passing it into this log. So that's mean resource acquisition is initialization. So when log actually acquired this mutex, it actually initializes it. So what does it mean? And you see there are no uh, any unlock here. So it's this log actually got this mutex. It locked here. It locked this mutex when it got it. And uh, when actually this log will be out of scope, the structure for this log will be called. It's a uh, quite usual thing in C++ when some object going out of scope, like the structure for it will call. And during destruction of this log, actually this mutex will be unlocked. It's make you, uh, it's, it makes this code is much more safer. So if you're using mutexes, always use them with lock, with lock guard. Do not use mutexes like this because it's all, you always have chance to, to leave your multi-threaded application locked forever. Uh, always use lock guard or scope guard. Uh, you also have scope guard, but it's C++ 17, so we admit it. Uh, I, I just give you a few words about this thing, like scope guard actually doing pretty much same what log guard do, but it can acquire a few mutexes. So the problem of log guard, if you have mutex one and mutex two and you want to block them, uh, want to lock them, uh, you'll, you'll run in problem. Uh, log guard can do it. And uh, you also run in problem if you try to do it like, uh, you say, okay, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, I can, uh, let's see. I, I can just create two log guards and why, why not? I can live with this. And this code will not work for you because uh, to log mutex, you need to do some atomic operations. And if you have these two calls, it's not atomic operation anymore. And it's mean like when you actually locking, when one thread actually locking this mutex, the second thread can actually lock this mutex. <laughs> and you need that like one thread actually lock two mutexes. And it's not possible in C++ 11. So in C++ 17, they added scoped guard. I probably need to, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Visual Studio 15. It's, it, it doesn't support C++ 11, uh, 17. So yeah, so, but believe me, it's a scope guard here and uh, scope guard is different that you can actually pass few mutexes here. You can uh, safely uh, acquire few mutexes for one thread. That's only difference for log guard and scope guard. Some people on Stack Overflow saying that you need to use a uh, scope guard like every time and log guard is deprecated. It's not true. Uh, log guard, it's still faster. Uh, so if you need to, if you need to acquire one mutex, you, you need to use log guard, and if you need to acquire few mutexes, you need you use scope guard because log guard is faster than scope guard. So yeah, uh, okay, let's run example five and see 
if my theory actually works and uh, safer and safe wallet will give you actually a good result. Uh, let's see if I, I didn't change code much. Uh, no, no, looks, looks pretty much good. And, uh, yeah, you see it's actually 5 million for, for all around symmetrics works. And Pivot's example is absolutely the same like this example, but uh, it just doesn't have mutexes. That's the only difference. So I'll give you this all, all project that you can play with this by yourself. Okay, uh, keep going. So exercise six, let's mean event handling. Uh, what does it mean event handling here? So uh, currently we see that all these threads actually run pretty much separately. They don't have any data to share. They don't have any data to synchronize. But what if you need to synchronize something? What, let's say we have two connections. Uh, we have actually one connection. The connection actually run uh, two tasks. One task is load setting, and second task is make connection. So you can make your connection before you actually loaded your settings. But you, need, uh, you want to make it separately in two different threads. Like uh, I want that one thread actually loads settings to me and second thread start to preparing the connection to me. Uh, it still depends from the settings, but it still can do some job before actually settings even was loaded. So why not? Uh, so I created this class connection here and this variable actually is loaded. Uh, it's, uh, this variable is actually sharded between two threads. Like, uh, so we're doing some load settings here and only if this load setting actually true, uh, the make connection can can like keep forward, can can keep doing something. So it's also a bad example here. Uh, in exercise seven, it will be much better. It's same thing, but much better. So and in exercise six, I show you like the bad way to implement sharing data, but also possible. So uh, it, it's very simple application. It's it's load settings. Uh, and this guy actually make connection. It's do handshaking for your server. And after this, it started to wait for data is loaded. And it actually, first of all, it still uses Mutex lock and lock, which we already said it's bad. You need to use lock guard here or scope guard here. It depends on what you want to achieve. Uh, and it, and, but the main thing, the main problem here is that it uses while loop and this while loop is actually still waiting until uh settings will be loaded uh, you also see that c plus plus 11 give you uh not just multi-threading but also a great flexibility with thread itself so you can say as the does this thread sleep for 100 milliseconds that's very cool actually uh it's also inside this thread library so be happy <laughs> Uh, so what we're doing here, we actually uh, going through this loop until uh, our settings will be loaded. And like every time we're waiting for 100 milliseconds and check again, and we, every time we log this mutex, like we're going here. So how it works, like if my connection will be actually first here and this mutex will be unlocked, it's going into this loop and we're waiting. But if application, uh, if actually load settings will be first here and acquires this mutex first, that means uh, my connection will stop here and it will wait until this mutex will be unlocked. And after it go into this file and uh, pretty much this value will be loaded. So uh, that's how data shares between these two threads is using this is loaded. But it's very inefficient way because first of all, you need to wait like this 100 milliseconds. Why not 1,000 1, milliseconds? Why not like one minute? Uh, every time when I see timer in computer programs, I always say something like, ah, <laughs> because when you, uh, uh, when you make uh, your code based on timer, you're definitely doing something even if it works, it's not works. It's not works in efficient way because you can't know how much milliseconds you need to wait. Uh, what if I'm using faster CPU? What if I? What if I'm using slower CPU? What if I? Uh, it's it's waste of CPU cycles. And what actually happens here? It's waste of CPU cycles. 
you're running this thread, you're waiting, uh, the thread is still busy, the CPU is still busy, and thread itself doing pretty much nothing. And uh, it's very inefficient. So I can show you that this thing actually works. And in exercise seven, I show you how to make it much more efficient. Just do a checking, it waits a bit, it's loading settings and make connection after data was loaded and leaving the thread and click route. That's plain and simple. So let's go for better way uh, to run same sync, same sharing data, but with conditional variable. So what the conditional variable do, it's actually our while <laughs> which waiting for something, but in much more efficient way it actually doing pretty much nothing when you start with conditional variable. Uh, your CPU load is zero, or almost zero, and your thread is still waiting until actually some condition will happen. So let's go into this code. Uh, it's pretty much the same. It uses load variable, it's loading settings, but here is condition variable, uh, which is using like this notify one. And here actually condition variable which waits. So how it works? When this thread came actually here first, it runs this wait. It uses this lock. Uh, see uh, here you can see we're using unique lock. Uh, it's not uh, guard lock like we used in previous example. That's not guard. Not lock guard circuit. It's not lock guard actually. It's unique lock. And uh, what difference between lock guard and unique lock. The difference actually is that unique lock can be changed. So unique lock can be unlocked. When lock guard actually can be unlocked when it destroyed, then unique lock actually can be unlocked when it's still alive. Uh, except this is pretty much the same thing. It also, um, it's a matrix also will be unlocked when unique lock actually destroyed. Uh, but it also gives you possibility to uh, unlock during its lifetime. So conditional variable actually took this unique lock and uh, it also took this bind function. Uh, what does bind function mean? So if actually unique lock will be, so it's waiting, this conditional variable will wait until this lock will be unlocked and this actually check will return true. So uh, it's loaded will be true. So it's doing like two checks to us. First check, actually, this log was unlocked. And second check, actually, this loaded will return true, like you can see. And if these two things happened, this condition happened, that means we keep going. We uh, not waiting anymore, and we keep going. So. And what actually will unlock this condition variable? Uh, condition, this condition variable will be unlocked if, as guys is not notify one actually, uh, it's it's not necessary. It will be unlocked. Yeah, I'm wrong here. It's not it's not necessary. It will be unlocked. But this condition variable will do check in this time. So when this condition variable will check this its condition. It will check its condition when it gets its notify one or notify all. It's also like two different methods, notify one and notify all. Uh, why is it different? Because uh, currently it's only one thread actually waiting based on this conditional variable. But in some code, in your code, uh, like you can have a lot of threads actually will be waiting based on this conditional variable. So if like that happens that uh, more than one thread is actually waiting for your conditional variable, you probably want to say notify all. And this conditional variable, when it's got notify all, will start this check procedure. Start uh, to check this lock, nobody lock it, just me. Check this state, so it will be unlock this value and it will not be wait anymore. So that's, that's how it works. It's, it's not unlocked because it, it's already unlocked, but yeah, <laughs> it will not wait anymore and it will keep going like farther. 
So, but here I have only one thread and I just use a notify one. If you have many threads, you also can use notify one. It's mean uh, this check will happens like thread by thread. It does mean only one thread actually will notify this uh, uh, to check this conditional variable. And only one thread actually can, can uh, keep going. Or like we can run them all, all together. So it's much better way actually to wait for something using conditional variables. And it also not just useful for multi-threading, it also useful for single threaded application when you need to wait for something. Let's say you wait for some event. Uh, it's much better than implementing timer or waiting loops or stuff like this. You can just use a conditional variable for waiting in your single threaded or multi-threaded application. It doesn't matter. It's a very good way for waiting for something. So, and that's how it synchronizes uh, two threads and how it synchronizes this loading, setting loading to just two threads. So, yeah, it's, it's a bad way. Yeah, it's much better. It's much better. Yeah. So, uh, exercise seven. So let's let's run exercise six to show you this absolutely the same example and run exercise seven. And run exercise here. It's uh, absolutely the same applications, but this one is actually much more efficient than, like, than this one in CPU law. Uh, okay, keep going. We're almost there. Uh, exercise eight, nine, and ten. Yeah, left. So, and also I'll show you some real world example after it. Like exercise eleven, but it's not part of this playground because it's actually some complex application, which not a part of any playground. So, uh, exercise eight introduce you something like as the future promise and return values for thread. So, I assume that until now you know how to run multi-threaded application. Uh, how to share data between them, how to pass data into them. And you actually have all knowledge what you need to, with work, to work with multi-threaded application. Now we're going to some more advanced stuff. It's uh, pretty much same what I showed you before, what I showed you before, but uh, it's more advanced. It gives you more flexibility, more power, more, <laughs> more actually professionalism. So first thing, it's... Uh, as to the future and as to the promise and how it works. So uh, you actually, uh, if you're running some, it's actually came from uh, multi-threaded terminology. Before C++11, there was lots, there was tons of different multi-threading frameworks and they already established some terminology. One of those terminology was promise and future. Uh, promise actually, it's uh, that thing what, uh, uh, what your thread give you like to calculate. So your trade, uh, your thread actually promise to you to calculate, let's say some int data. So you created this promise for your thread and this thread will calculate. Uh, what this promise means, this means we, will, we can wait until the thread will calculate this int. Or we can't, like how we like it. It's like I said, you can do, Think like this using join and detach what what I shown you before, but this in more advanced way this in in more way how actually previous multi threaded framework works. So it was created in C++ land because the programmers already used multi threading like for decades, and they probably stuck with old principles with old idea and old terminology. And C++ eleven actually give you this <laughs> if you're some old programmer and don't want to learn something new you can use old ideas so you create this promise uh from promise you can get future future actually is controlling interface for your promise because when you pass promise into your thread uh you can actually go away uh you can actually go out of scope with this thread and you know you don't need to keep your promise anymore you pass it into your thread but you need to keep this future you need to keep this interface which actually binded, which actually bound to, to your thread. And what I'm doing here, I create a promise. I got the future from this promise. I created a new thread. I put this promise in. And when this promise will be satisfied, 
Lens is actually promised set value, like will be satisfied. This future actually will unblock this thread. So I run this thread, the thread's running separately. We're going here and we stop here. So until this future is satisfied, the code is blocked. Like this exercise eight will be waiting here until the set value will be set. In exact moment when the set value actually will be initialized, the future will return this value to you and the thread will be unblocked. That's how it is. <laughs> Even if you're using this advanced functionality, you still need to call join because as we know, you always need to call join or detach for your new created thread. It's a rule number one. So that's how promise at future works. It's a very simple example. Like until this value will be satisfied, we're blocking the thread. Okay, cool. But if we're not, uh, let's say we're not calling this uh, feature get, this thread will not be blocked here. It will be blocked here actually because we're joining here, but it will not be blocked here. Like we, we like the advantage of future and promise that we can wait or can't wait like how we like and we can do it procedurally we can actually change the rules with some if else statements and we can play like we want it's not like for this it's not necessary to call join or detach uh it's not like it's necessary to call join and detach but it's not necessary for promise and future it's not necessary for future to call get every time you like do as you like to do Okay, so it was exercise, uh, yeah, eight. It's very simple, so I will not run it. It will show you just 18. How far, so it's exercise nine, and it's more advanced, it's much more advanced exercise. It's show you actually how uh, this STD future and promise works, but also with using this async and package task. So, uh, even if you're using multi-threaded framework, sometimes you want to run your threads in one thread, actually. <laughs> you want to run your threads like step by step. And for some another time, you want to run your threads uh, separated. And if you're using just this join or the touch stuff, like every thread here will be run separately. But let's say like for some circumstances i i don't want to run them separate i want to run them step by step and for some another circumstances i want to run them separate so for this you have this async sync uh, as to the async uh again so yeah uh so this run is very simple uh there no any uh multi-threading here they're just of two functions uh, which actually do string concatenation is waiting for five seconds every every function and doing string concatenation and it's run in normal classical way just call functions no any multi-threading and second example actually is same approach but multi-threading with help of async function so, uh, how it works how it works so it works pretty much the same way. Uh, when you call async, you can get future, the same future that you can get from promise. You can get this future when you run this async, as the async. But as the async, they uh, take, it's actually take uh, function itself. It's pretty much the same like std thread, but std async. But if your thread always run uh, separately, as the async can be controlled by this flag. It can run separately or asynchronously, like you see here, or it can be run deferred. That's mean in the same way like you call on uh, uh, on usual step call function. It, it will run like step by step. So we want to run asynchronously. Uh, and we get future here from this asynchronous run. We pass function here. We pass value to function, pass attribute to function. And uh, 
Same thing happened like in previous example eight. You see this feature actually blocks this function, uh, blocks main thread. And same thing happens here. This uh, future data db get actually blocks main thread until this data will be ready. It will wait until this data will be ready. So, and uh, like to show that it works, this first example actually two functions, they wait for five seconds. And in normal runs, it will take 10 seconds. And in uh, asynchronous run, it will take only five seconds because these two functions will run asynchronously by five seconds each. So, show this, show this. Need to wait 10 seconds, yeah, actually 15 seconds <laughs> to be sure that this runs properly. So, yeah, first actually finished by 10 seconds. This concatenated these two strings, and uh, second actually finished by five seconds and concatenated the strings. It did pretty much the same, but faster, two times faster. So, guys, uh, that's the time for questions because. Currently, I'm done with uh, abilities what you have for uh, C++ 11. So one more thing actually happens in C++ uh, in exercise 10. I'll show you this thing like hardware concurrency. Uh, it's quite easy. Uh, this thing actually returns your number of uh, hardware thread what you have. So for the CPU, you're actually going back four usually, but for different CPU, you'll have different values and uh, yeah. Uh, also, this core count actually can return zero value. Uh, if for some reason C++ can't, can't know how much cores you have, like for example, using some, I don't know, some specific uh, operation system or specific CPU, uh, it's possible that hardware concurrency will return zero. So be careful, always check this value. And if this value is zero, just put some hard-coded value here, keep going. Uh, but that's pretty much it, what I want to uh, say about uh, library itself, about this thread library, which also is mutexes and feature and Trona. Trona is not multi-thread, it's thing. think it's new timer, which is very cool, but this three actually is from multi-threading, it's threads, mutex, and feature. So yeah, that's it. And here I'll show you more about approaches for multi-threading. Uh, two approaches, like mainly two approaches. There's a lot more architectural approaches, but uh, they all divided on two main parts. It's log-based and log-free. And uh, both has their own uh, pros and cons. And I'll, I'll talk about them, about them like about one minute. So it's time for questions if you have about uh, library itself. I'm glad to hear anything. And we, 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 we will continue. I have a question. Uh, can you please go back to exercise five? Yes. So why do we, or is it, it's six probably. It's one with um, conditional variable. Uh, with conditional variables probably. Seven, yes. Okay, so, so why do we need Boolean here? We are calling notify one, doesn't uh, it means the conditional variable will wake up? Why we yes. need extra Boolean? Yes, we need extra Boolean because uh, something may happen during loading. Like uh, it's not necessary while well, you get this notifi notifications, the loaded is well su successful. Here is AI, in this example, it's always successful, but in real world, you actually need to do some additional check because uh, it may happen that file was corrupted, something was happened, and you probably don't want to make connection with such settings. So we're doing just two checks. Okay, I, made it, I made it just to show that it's possible. That it's possible not just check lock itself, but also check some additional uh, variable. And second question is actually in exercise five when you mentioned that locking two lock guards in a row wouldn't work because thread may skip to locking uh, second mutex. Can you elaborate a little bit more, please? Because I, I don't think any thread can skip locking of a mutex to like another line after it. Uh, 
body, you write something like this. It's mean like all other threads will waiting, all other threads will be blocked. This this application will never finish. I can show. No, you. no, you you showed an example where where you type two log guards in a row, trying trying to lock oh. two different mutexes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it will not work. It's there is chance that it will not work. It actually may work uh, for you, but it actually may not. So I understand what you mean. Uh, yeah, like this, if you want to, like let's say mutex one and mutex two, yeah, and you want to lock actually these two mutexes in time. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's what you mean. Uh, okay, so what can happen here? Uh, so this, this two operation is not uh, atomic. Like if, if uh, for example, uh, two threads going into, uh, into this function and trying to log these two mutexes. And you're right, if actually two threads going into this particular function and trying to log these two mutexes, it will work. It will work like every time and you no need to scope gut. But if you have some another function, for example, uh, use money. And it's doing pretty much the same thing here. Like, let's reduce money function. I think you already got the point, yeah? If you have reduced money and it's doing pretty much the same thing. And if thread one actually running in add money and thread two actually running in reduce money and minus minus. And this thread is start to allocate this mutexes. It's not safe. Uh, it, it's, they have actually race conditions here. Uh, they started to get race conditions because, uh, for example, we don't have mutex one. We, have. we need to lock only just mutex two here and not mutex one here. And this thread actually started to lock mutex one it took like two uh, two frames for for CPU. It start locks with this mutex, but another thread is already locked this mutex. So you're doing it simultaneously, yeah. And second thread going here, and papa, it doesn't work. See but, the problem? but the same would happen with scoped guard if no. I uh, pass them in uh, reverse order, or if I only pass one of them. So it's not a problem with lock guards specifically. It's that you're locking them in uh, not in the same order every time. Uh, for scope guard, it doesn't matter the order. First of all, if you're passing uh, your attributes into scope guard order, it doesn't matter. It's guarantee that all these mutexes will be locked at the same time. And for lock guard, it's not guarantee. For log guard, actually, order is make sense, and it actually took two frames for log for log two matrices, and for scope guard, it actually took, let's say, one frame to to log this matrix. So that's the difference between scope guard and log guard. Like log guard, do not guarantee uh, that it's not atomic operation. It's not it's not guarantee you that you can acquire all these two matrices when you want to acquire them because Somewhere in the code may happen that mutex two uh, will be acquired. Or if, if you have more mutexes, if you have like five mutexes here, like some mutex three or mutex four can be locked before you're actually going to your particular role. And for scope guard, it doesn't happen. Scope guard actually guarantee you that it will lock all these mutexes at the same time, if it can. If it can't, it will not lock them all. So you know what's the problem? Like if you, the problem if you like lock mutex one, but do not lock mutex two, it's not maybe a problem for you in this function, but it's problem for multi-threaded application itself because mutex one is already locked, but doing pretty much nothing. And mutex two also locked, but with different thread, which doing different thing. And if some sort thread came here, it came to mutex one, it's already locked, it also doing nothing. So what doing scope guard to you? If scope guard can acquire these mutexes, it actually acquires them. If it can't, it, it, it doesn't acquire all mutexes. It doesn't acquire like all these two mutexes. They, they will be 
let's say if if such thing like scope uh, if such thing happens here like uh it's mean if it's not possible to acquire mutex2 because mutex2 was already locked that's mean scope guard will not acquire mutex1 also and actually lock guard will acquire it so if you want to so the rule here if you want to acquire few mutexes at the same time, you go guard and if you need to acquire one mutex you use lock guard that's the idea do i answer your question yes thank you okay ah uh, But still, it's not C++ 17. Uh, I think we will have part two, and at part two, I'll show you benefits from C++ 17. Actually, C++ 14 is nothing much was added into C++ 11. Uh, it's pretty much same functionality. And C++ 17 has some significant changes, and I'll show you those changes. Later. So it's, we're currently talking about C++ 11. Uh, because it's it's a huge topic, how you can see we already spoke almost for an hour and a half, and I still not finished yet. <laughs> uh, okay, so the last part actually it's uh, about approach, log based approach and logs free approach. So uh, those exercises what I show you uh, in in most they was highly inefficient because uh, like let's say this exercise five. Uh, when you log this function and waiting and other four threads actually waiting until first thread actually will finish its job. Other four threads doing actually pretty much nothing because it was locked. And that's actually the problem of locked based architecture. Like if you have these locks in your code, that's mean that's possible that some other thread will just waiting. So you waste your CPU cycles, you waste your CPU resources here. Uh, yeah, uh, you can do nothing with this because uh, not every algorithm can be log free. Uh, most of algorithms, like 75% of more algorithms, it's my own estimation and I not pretend <laughs> to be precise here, but most of algorithms actually are not log free because they are based on some other values. Like if you want to calculate this value, for example, you need to wait for some particular operation happen and you need to log execution, like actually exercise seven, show it's better. Like before I actually make connection, you need to wait for load settings. And when you're actually waiting here, it's also log-based architecture, log-based approach. When you're waiting here, you're actually wasting your CPU cycles. That's a problem. Uh, when you implement multi-threaded architecture, it makes sense to you to think if you can do it without locks completely. If you can implement your code so parallel that it will be even embarrassingly to think about it, how actually parallel this code is. So let's call lock-free approach and lock-free approach actually some people call embarrassingly parallel approach. Let's say it's on Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, embarrassingly parallel paradigm. You can read about it. And also show you a few algorithms which actually uh, looks good and actually can be implemented in a uh, log-free way or embarrassingly parallel way. But you see it's not like too much of this algorithm. It's, but you always can think about it, how to change algorithms or how to change your approach to reduce amount of logs to zero or to some low values. So Gante, I'll show you two different examples. They do pretty much the same, but one example actually running in log-free way and second example running in log-based way. So you have this calculate random numbers and you see like few threads will start to calculate random numbers for this vector and they need to log this mutex has global mutex. You need to log this mutex actually before you can uh, go to this vector value and calculate random number to it for obvious reasons, which I show you on exercise uh, five. 
yeah, exercise, no, exercise four, when you got actually tons of uh, incorrect numbers due to race conditions. So to eliminate race conditions, you need to actually lock this vector value locked it and after this you can check if this value wasn't calculated you actually calculate random number to it and it's log based approach but you can be smart and you can you divide your vector a few parts let's say start to end and you can calculate the random uh, values in few threads for your vector without any locking because you know that this range is unique for every thread like you know that first thread actually starts from zero to let's say twenty five thousand, and second vector starts from twenty five thousand to fifteen thousand. A uh, second thread and third thread starts, and like every thread has its own range in this vector to calculate random numbers. Uh, they do not using this locking, and that means this code will be highly efficient because they no waiting. All four threads will be run it here. We can do the job without any waiting, without any interruption, in full power on in full CPU power. And you also will have correct result. And so that's the difference between log free and log based approach. Uh, like don't be naive. <laughs> It's very rare when you can use this log-free approach. Usually in uh, enterprise application, you will stuck with log-based approach pretty much. And maximum what you can do is just reduce the amount of these logs to make, it, uh, to make your application faster. Uh, but, for, but sometimes log-free actually is useful. And uh, sometimes, and I show you when it's useful. And uh, so let's go. Uh, so what we're we doing here, we're also getting this core counts. I'll already show you this. It's uh, show you core count. It's four counts actually here, and we divide the rate size on uh, number of count for uh, this parts approach, and we will run actually every thread. I using just the async here in the synchronous run, and I passing vector right, like reference here, and uh, this vector will be calculated and we're waiting that future actually will be ready that future will return value so and we also pass this indices uh, more naive approach don't have indices they just passed vector and also wait for the future so let's run oh. So you see the difference. You see the second approach actually. Oh, we also run in debug mode, which is much faster. That's right. So I need to detach debug when I need it. So you see that uh, second approach is much, it's tremendously faster than uh, log-based approach, this naive approach. That's because uh, it doesn't mean log is slow. It means I used just very bad example to you, uh, like almost. Uh, every time uh, other threads actually waiting for another thread here. So that's why uh, this log-based approach got such, such bad result. It doesn't mean that log guard actually is slow. It's, it's quite fast actually. It's automatic operation, automatic operations are fast by itself. But uh, the reason that, uh, that threads actually waiting for each other produce such bad results, such low result. So, and Log free approach actually got just eight milliseconds when log based approach got is 38 milliseconds to calculate. So the last thing what I show you, and uh, so uh, now I go to uh, talk more in details where we can use log free approach. Like uh, with log based approach, it's quite simple. You use it's everywhere where you can you can't use log free approach. So log free approach is very useful for computer graphics applications and for physics calculation applications. So uh, currently we have GPUs, it's graphics processing unit, which uh, works much faster with computer graphics than CPU. And the secret of GPU, why it works much faster than CPU, that's because it was designed to be log free 
So it's highly parallel chip, which can run tons of threads, but all the threads, it's log free. It's a big limitation of GPU actions. That's why you can't run same code on GPU, what you can run on CPU. And if you have this log-free approach, it gives you a ton of benefits because with log-free approach, you pretty much don't have this scheme anymore. You don't have this shared memory anymore. Like every thread has its own memory. That's what's make actually it's log-free because you don't have shared memory, so you don't have logs. You, you don't need to log uh, to read or write for some memory. Like every thread run in this separate, environment and it's pretty much like processes but even without inter-process communication like this part also omit for uh, for log free approach and uh, and gpu actually is very fast here because it's this chip is specially designed do not use sharded memory I do not use logs. It's much more simpler than CPU in its design. So it can run much more threads. Uh, yeah. So I can show you some specific approach. It's beyond of C11 multi threading, but I can show you where you can go farther with multi threaded approach. Uh, so, first of all, I need to know how to. One second, guys. I need to. Close this remote desktop, <laughs> so it can be a problem because of this panel. Uh, it can be a problem. Yeah. Uh, how how to close this panel? Uh, I'm floating meeting control problem. Yeah, fine. So let's close this panel and show you this project. It's much older project. It's using C plus uh, plus, two thousand ten and. C++ 2010 do not support uh, uh, Visual Studio 2010 do not support uh, C++ 11 multi-threading library. So uh, I wrote this project, it's my homebrew actually. And I wrote it, I designed it to use multi-threaded in some way. Uh, I just been happy for multi-threading, uh, but when I, be, when I feel some power to migrate on higher version of Visual Studio with this project, I will definitely will start with C++11 because C++11 is so much better than uh, WinAPI implementation of multi threading but we got what we got. But even with this approach, I go a little bit farther. Like, it's just a small scene. So finally, it's theory ends and some real world application appear. So this scene actually show you uh, some rendering, and it also some physics. Currently, I'm working on physics engine, and this physics engine also uses multi-threading for uh, object uh, integration. Uh, for collision, it's still using a uh, classic approach. It, it calculates collision in one thread, but I will rewrite it. I actually uh, will rewrite it soon, and collisions also will be multi-threaded, but it's a bit tricky, actually, to run collisions in multiple threads. Uh, and also I beyond a little bit farther with this. Uh, for this particular water, I using simulation. Uh, this water I actually grid, a grid with size 256 on 256. And even for CPU, it's too much to calculate it in multiple thread. In, even for powerful CPU, it's too much. Because if you multiply uh, 256 on 256, you got 70, uh, 65, 53, 6. Yeah. So it's quite a big number of thread you need to run for your CPU. And you actually can calculate every cell on this water uh, separately. And that's actually a case when uh, embarrassingly parallel architecture looks great. There's actually a case when embarrassingly parallel architecture is implementable. I can simulate this cell, every cell in this water actually simultaneously. And I don't have shared memory. I don't have logs here. But even if I try run this on CPU, it will be too much. Because my CPU, my current CPU has just 16 threads. Uh, it's my home machine. It has just 16 threads and it needs to simulate 75 thousands. <laughs> and it can be a problem, yeah? 
So what we can do here, we actually can run this code on GPU. Uh, because my GPU uh, actually... Alex, Alex yeah. sorry for interruption, but I just uh, remind that we have a couple of minutes. Maybe uh, other participants have other questions. Okay, I have just one minute and I'm finished with this, so. so. Yeah, as a CPU approach and GPU approach mixed together, all runs multi-threading and we have something like this. So we have this physics engine, we can delete RAID, it's still not ready. But this water actually simulated with multiple threads on GPU. GPU has, my GPU actually has 2000 scores and it's much bigger value than 16 cores on CPU. And if you'll try to run this code on CPU, it will be much, much, much more slower than if you're running this on GPU. So the main idea here actually, that if you stuck with, if you actually was lucky enough to get log-free approach or embarrassingly parallel approach, use GPU. It's very, it's very good for GPU. This is it, guys. <laughs> so, yep. Thank you. Mm, any questions? Yes. So, for next, actually, uh, for part two. I'll describe to you in details multi-threading architectures, and we actually can keep C plus plus seventeen also with multi-threading. We will spoke more. We will speak more about scope guard. I'll show you like on practice difference between log guard and scope guard, and uh, also it's it's C plus plus seventeen has not not much info to to speak about. So I'll try to describe you architectures, different architectures, different log-free architectures or log-based architectures. I also show you in details how actually multi-threading was implemented for this physics engine. We'll see like more detailed approach and practice and how these things work. So, yeah. So. Any questions, guys? This water simulation looks pretty nice it, if it was done from scratch. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, it looks really good. I spent a lot of time of it. It has very simple code. It's, well, it's based on shaders. So uh, that's, that's all. <laughs> it's not much, yeah. And it looks really good. It's it's this this particular case when something simple can be something really cool. Mm. We actually even compare simulation, water simulation in a real engine with uh, this approach, and like a lot of people say that this approach looks better <laughs> than real engine's approach. So yeah, I have something to prove. No, not not much, but still. <laughs> And no, nobody's saying about shadows. Spent tons of time on the shadows and nobody tries them. <laughs> so guys, any questions for C++11? Uh, maybe you have some concerns. Uh, do I, I, anybody from now will start to use C++11 for multi-threading? Because it's very simple, it's very cool. I hope to see more multi-threaded applications in self-serve, like since now. So guys, if you don't have any questions, we can finish because I have another meeting on two o'clock and I need to prepare to it. Uh, I'll send you this uh, project so you can play with this, but I don't send you this project. <laughs> it's still my property. Anyway, uh, all. Anyway, this project do not contain any C plus plus eleven multi threading, and this project actually is based on C plus plus eleven multi threading. So that's definitely what I'll share with you. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>